came a couple of days ago. Yesterday. Yesterday, and he has taken the time to be with us today again. Uh, it's a great honor for us. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce him. Uh, he is uh, <coughs> present. He is the president of the Institute for Political and International Studies in Tehran, with the rank of Deputy Foreign Minister. He has had a most distinguished career. He was advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on strategic issues. He was ambassador of Iran to the United Nations in Geneva. He was director general of the Institute for Political and International Studies. And he has also a very distinguished education career. He studied international relations in Tehran. And then he did his PhD in political science from George Washington University and a postdoctoral fellowship from Harvard University. He speaks many languages, English, Arabic, French, apart from his native Farsi. Uh, Excellency, we have all been concerned with the uh, events that have been happening recently in our region, in fact, all over the world with respect to Iran, and so I won't take much time. I'd be very grateful if you would share your views with us. Thank you, Ambassador. It's a pleasure for me to be here again. I'm only the place that I have uh, visited and I uh, have spoken. This place is very special and I love the style, books, and the other time I came also the audience with the questions and curiosity along with a sympathy and friendship that I feel in Pakistan, which I cannot Feed me our places uh, makes this institute a very forgettable, unforgettable uh, place for me, and I'm so proud to be here. And I thank the Council General for organizing also this trip because I came yesterday coming tonight. Uh, I think it's best that I, in the beginning I said what what I have. Today is very personal, so it's not official yet. So you have an ambassador, you know, and you're an ambassador, you have to be very careful about warnings uh, and, uh, you know, all these issues. Uh, there are several jokes about this. I think I used one three years ago. Yeah, but I don't want to repeat it. Uh, but it's not bad to say a new one and I start with a joke, if possible. Just the joke is for distancing from, uh, let's say, the official uh, carefulness on the world. And the joke says, you know, what's the difference between an ambassador, a general, and a scholar? And the answer is, of course, it's a joke. A general is paid to die for his country. Everybody generals should be ready to go war and die. And ambassadors are paid to lie about their country. <laughs> and the scholars are, I think I can talk loud here. Yeah. And ambassadors uh, are paid to lie, and the scholars are paid to explain why he's ready to die and why he's ready to lie. <laughs> So I start by this uh, why, why the situation is as it's today. Uh, uh, in a sort of just telling you all the positions, which is very easy, of course, we usually condemn you know, interventions, but why the situation is as it is today. Uh, and where we stand, of course. ABC for this. I think uh, if you want to understand the situation, or the tensions that exist in the region. First is in this, what I call, American contradiction, contradictory policies. This is my A. B, I think, is bitchiness, which we have for quite a uh, some time. And finally, my C is uh, cooperative possibilities, 
And a war that we had uh, 30 years ago, imposed on us more than 30 years ago, was uh, in the name of uh, fancy ideology, which is uh, very uh, narrow-minded reading of uh, a very racist uh, narrative of Arab nationalism, of course, rejected by the other Arabs. So I think uh, this is where we see the contradiction of the policy, maximum pressure. Of course, my personal view is that maximum pressure is for weakening Iran. Why weakening Iran? Because Iran is on rise. And Iran on rise is not just up to one policy, it is accumulated reasons, if I'm as a scholar here to explain, not to die, no? Or to die. Uh, I have to say why Iran is on rise. Very quickly. Geopolitically, a strategy. Several significant factors. One is uh, the demise of Soviet Union. Soviet Union was a superpower in our proximity. Our relationship with Soviet Union, I mean, in a strategic conceptualization was asymmetrical to the benefit of Soviet Union. I was telling Ambassador Peter to the morning, we had 10 the army, 10 divisions before the revolution. Soviet Union had 24 divisions in our army. So it was asymmetrical. The minds of Soviet Union opened it. The minds of Saddam Hussein opened the US. And other mistakes that the West did. I don't want to go to the details. Many mistakes. Missing security, 100% of us. Software side and hardware side. So it's an achievement. I mean, technology that was produced domestically. Look at this issue of drum, American drum, which was shot down at the uh, 58,000 feet. So uh, I, uh, I think these are elements that have given rise to Iran. And I think they want to weaken Iran. Of course, they cannot. They, but, but they push. They push for it. However, it's very contrary. We want to negotiate with Iran. Can you uh, negotiate with anybody whom you have put a knife on his, uh, let's say, throat and say, come and negotiate? We consider American sanctions against people of Iran as a terrorist war, a, an economic terrorist, terrorism and a war. In any war, if you want to have negotiation, at least show your desire for ceasefire, cessation of hostility, and so on and so forth. So maximum pressure has brought maximum resistance from the Iranians, but what I want to conceptualize, it is not because of Iran, because because of the United States, contradictory policy. B, the situation, I want to give more space to question and answer. I think we have a state of bitterness. We are between two eras in international politics. One era, or one option, one alternative is when a superpower comes and puts its domestic laws as an international frame. And the other one is multilateral diplomacy and the institutions, international law, and so on and so forth. And we are in a state of transition. Of course, the transition has been going for the last 25 years. But right now, the U.S. is frustrated. We, when we say we, I don't mean just Iran, we, members of the international community, either to accept norm, international norms, frames, multilateral diplomacy, or a, an executive order on an American president will become international law. What Iran it's not about Iran per se. This is why Robert Copeland, the famous geopolitician, wrote a piece which I suggest you to read. 
two weeks ago in New York Times. It, it, it's about Iran. But you know what's the title? The title is very interesting one ambassador says it is all about China. The title is it's all, all about China. So it's a state of weakness, cooperation or confrontation. Coercion or rules of law. I think uh, we are also in a transition whether we want to accept realities that all the byproducts of recent times or we want to go to all part of all paradigm. Yesterday I was here, we had a very good seminar on Iran, Pakistan and Turkey with CPSD. And I said, look, these three players Pakistan, Iran, and uh, Turkey are the real regional players. They have real estates. The states here are real. We have a state, concept of state. And what's interesting, they are connected through a regional, let's say, perspective. And the regions before and after of Cold War time are different. Before Cold War time, you had a vertical regionalism. It was from above. Now you have regionalism horizontally from below. It is a transition. The US doesn't want to accept this transition. It looks at Pakistan, at Iran, at Turkey, with a very old-fashioned angle. I read some of the American papers. I am so angry uh, when I see this Pakistan bashing. For what reason? Because I think they, they have a model. They cannot accept reality that Pakistan now is a regional player. Regional player. Yes, everybody of us, I mean, Turkey, Iran, and uh, Pakistan, we have our own challenges, no doubt. Economic, social, and political, whatever you want to call it. But the reality is that we are regional players. So, this uh, state of business is very important. I think this transition in time in international politics is related to the tension that they, they, want. they want Iran to be at the Iran of before the revolution. But there was a revolution against those systems. There's different. Now let me go to my sea. We have two options, cooperation or conflict. We are for cooperation with regional things. We are for reducing tensions with even the, the Arab uh, members of uh, uh, our vicinity and neighborhood. And with JCPOA, we have said, go back to the cooperative <coughs> mechanism that we have. But they use the threat of confrontation. We think that this threat is an instrument of terrorizing rather than uh, actuality. It's a psychological warfare. We of course understand the real picture, but what is important that the defense of a land, the system of a land, and whatever comes with our identity. Uh, so there is a psychological dimension to this coercion and confrontation. And then it is psychology, the will is very important. Our will is to defend our achievements, our values, and our system. And this is where we started to point here. Uh, this is where I don't want to go to the, let's say, option part or whatever. But I think this is where I personally enjoy Pakistan's sympathy and understanding that Iran has not done anything wrong that Iran is for corporate.
the processes. So let me uh, stop here. I try to give an uh, analytical picture, but I think I cannot debate also my ambassadorial heart. I say I don't have much hair, but I have two hats. Sometimes I mix my hats together, but let's be some kind of notion. I also express my notion that it is about resistance. It is about the of the country. And I have to report at the end that there is a rising sense of nationhood, nationalism, passion, as what we really want to call it, that this goes beyond the usual trust. Now everybody is feeling that we have to defend because the pressure is ideological, is hegemony, and hegemony is an impossibility. So I stop here, and I hope I can waste your time. Uh, emotion is a very good thing, it leads to many solutions. Who is going to ask the first question? Sir, a very brief and excellent lecture you have given and we are very grateful that you again come here and when you came two years ago I also had interaction with you. My question, two questions, very simple question. Uh, the Japanese parents came to uh, proceed the library and club, so uh, he wanted actually to have a conversation with the town. So could you highlight uh, what were the conversations between Japanese Prime Minister and the Reverend Nata first. And second, uh, the Americans are very much afraid of your missile program. This is the reason why they detect you know, from that uh, nuclear program. So, would you please comment about your missile programs? Thank you. I think on the first part of your question, uh, we have a good relationship with Japan. Uh, contrary to what they say in the West, Iran is not isolated. We have relations with everybody in the world, with, of course, a few exceptions. With Japan, we have a very traditional relationship. Actually, 90 years of uh, uninterrupted diplomatic relationship. And a good understanding, of course, of Iran and Japan and vice versa. I just want to give you very short uh, circle of You know, when in uh, 1950s we had this struggle of nationalization of oil, uh, the same guys who are pushing pressure on us these days asked for the Security Council meeting to condemn Iran for nationalization of, nationalization of its oil. And they said nationalization of Iran oil is against peace and security of the world. Uh -huh. And of course, we were involved with there are uh, long stories. But Japanese sent a tank to Iran to show that there are with Iran, the Iranian people. Symbolically, they challenge, you know, this, uh, let's say, uh, sense. And there is a very good book, uh, research on that tank I forgot. It was even more symbolic than substantive, but it a star, it's like a star in the disconnectivity between Iran and Japan. So this is the background. Uh, Japanese Prime Minister came to Iran. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's first time between Iran and Japan. Yeah, it was among uh, the issues that uh, Raised. Uh, but you know what's interesting in this regard your question, uh, our uh, Supreme Leader had a very interesting discussion with him. You know, he said President Trump won, uh, he's giving me assurance that he doesn't want a new change and he's uh, for negotiation uh, and this type of naughty uh, one. And our Supreme Leader had a very, very interesting answer. I shared with you two One was that uh, regime change. 
maybe his wish. We don't need him to say that, you know, of course, it's not the exact word of Supreme Leader. Even if he wants, he cannot do it. No? That's very important. They cannot change our system. So giving this verbal, let's say, assurance or pronouncement doesn't mean anything. The second point, which he said, that he is not sincere. Why is not sincere? Exactly, this is our supreme answer. When he's sending you, he's putting new sanctions on Iran, on Iranian petrochemicals. So what can we believe? In Persian we say, Hassan Azat Abbas or Dome Khurus. I think you know the expression, it means somebody has a stolen a what do you call Khurus? A, no? Rosa. Rosa. And has stolen it and was hiding it, you know, in his uh, old body. And he was swearing to Hazrat Abbas, you know, for certain Ali, that he has not stolen it. But it was uh, clear because the, you know, the wing of this uh, rosa was there. And the person who was uh, talking with him said, which one should I believe? You're swearing to Hazrat Abbas or the signs of, you know, this rosa. So this is where the logic of uh, Trump was challenged very eloquently because this is public, you can see. Uh, and I think uh, uh, this is my personal understanding that all, all we got the, the point that this is the good things. On the other side, uh, you know, nobody serves us anything. If we want even to buy, of course we don't buy, but if we want to buy, nobody serves us yeah. with the technology. And you know the numbers, not just purchase of military, on expenditure of military, I think based on city report, Iran is expanding annually around 15, 16 billion dollars on military, so the Arabia is expanding. 66 billion dollars, uh, and most of them goes for military purchases. So we learned during the course of Iran Iraq war that we have to depend upon our own resources, and Iranian missile technology was produced during this experience. And it is a defensive mechanism of Iranian security. So it's not a threatening tool for the other. It is not. Uh, it is actually the only area which Iran may have technological edge on the others. They buy the most sophisticated weapons from the United States, from Europe, the European countries. The most sophisticated aircrafts, you know, whatever you want to call it. They have today, so Arabia has missiles with more range, range than Iran. Hmm? So, the, the whole discourse on Iranian missile technology is about depriving Iran from a an edge which it has and it's not domestically produced. So we look at it as a very, uh, let's say, uh, negative uh, discourse against our situation. And if you look at the statistics, what they do, what type of missiles they have, I think you, you, you can see the picture. Thank you, Benjamin. When I put this uh, point to you, let me first stress that I think uh, on behalf of all I know in Pakistan, we are completely at one with you. 
the people and the government of Iran in this situation. I only wish our state interests and our government enabled a more vigorous expression. And I hope that our Prime Minister uh, takes the initiative in his forthcoming meeting with that gentleman who has mistakenly been elected to the White House. What I want to put to you, sir. Uh, can, can I have a joke here? Yes. I that gentleman. <laughs> From, because he's very smart. You know what? Because in the sense of one brain, he has two brains. Right brain and left brain. But there is only one problem. In the right brain, nothing is left, and in the left brain, nothing is right. <laughs> there is okay. a, a query that occurs to one that notwithstanding the very, very special relationship we have as neighbors, and we respect this great legacy of Iranian civilization and goodwill. There is a perception among some in Pakistan that Iran sometimes has tended to look the other way when elements supported covertly by India have used Iranian territory to conduct very, very anti-Pakistan destructive acts. And this is not to say that we have not also lapsed. There are extremists who have infiltrated across the border and done that. But the capture of a serving Indian naval commander, as you know, illustrated this paradox. Would you care to comment on this perception that exists? Very important in this quality of us. So we have a good structure, and I have to say an excellent structure. Why I say so? I'm not saying just for the quality courts. Because there is no fundamental issue between Iran and Pakistan. You cannot be point to a very, let's say, territorial issue, very strategic issue, security issue that uh, divides us. Furthermore, I think the structure is good because the channels of communication are so solid, so available. And uh, I think it's very important at uh, all levels. Furthermore, this structural relationship is of a very significant nature when it refers to the domestic, uh, domestic side of Iran. By domestic side, I mean, you know Iran, you really know. Iran is a diverse society, very diverse. We are having debates on everything. You can see live on television, uh, you know, even in parliaments, in papers. We have a dynamism in this. But the Iranian partisan relationship is a matter of consensus among all. So you cannot find anybody in Iran who is not for a better relationship between Iran and Pakistan. I have never seen, you know, I'm part of the Iranian foreign policy community, never seen anybody against this consensus. So I think the structure uh, and this consensus uh, based policy should be taken into account. Uh, of course, uh, no perceptions matter in international relations, but they say when we discuss about perceptions, perceptions may not be right. Uh, you know, perceptions may, uh, however you have to, to, uh, to understand, but I think in a, in a bigger picture, uh, you have to see the structure and uh, the workability of relationship, and that the relationship with any other actors, third party, it is not going to be against Pakistan and vice versa. I think Pakistan relationship with third parties and not just one third party you know, is uh, not against Iran. We are very sure about that. So I think in, in, in it is not going to the details of that uh, single issue which I don't have the details after it and I heard. But I think with this structural uh, picture, 
I assure you that nothing is in Iran and Pakistan relationship which can even be uh, a matter of concern. Okay. But my question is, uh, when we are looking around uh, the, uh, the regional player, as we have said before, uh, there should be the more effective uh, role of Iran in uh, Afghanistan because we are facing a lot of, a lot of uh, the, uh, contentions from the uh, Iran side, uh, from the Afghanistan side. That means why we are talking about the APS because being the educational side very much touched by the, you know, you must have heard about the APS, that the Army Public School people, about 250 students were modeled. Yeah, you mean. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But yeah. So these things were, uh, are being uh, done from the Afghanistan that was mostly being thought about that. Yes. Don't you think that the Iran should play a more effective role to solve the problem? Although I know that the Afghanistan has uh, been the warrior throughout their life, I think that things have been changed now. We should be as uh, the impacted government which can fulfill all the requirements of the, uh, the troops over there. But I think they should be the more, as being the, uh, the, the Iranian uh, way close to our heart, we think that they should be the more effective uh, role to be played over there. Thank you. Can you please indicate, uh, so to say, with our relations with India? We have good relations with India and we have good relations with us. Is the possibility of Iran bringing us together? or to East Texas, which is the two Yeah, I can take all the questions and answer them. <laughs> Thank you, Excellency. Could you enlighten the August House regarding even very promising and pragmatic development of relationship with Qatar and Taliban as a thank to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Anybody else? The research staff, anybody? Thank you for the Or effective. 
to the limits that we have, we are both active and effective. Now on India Pakistan, I think the long story and in you know, ups and downs uh, in, in this relationship, I think uh, we, we wish for a better situation. But I think this this is based upon I mean we are suggesting on a request and readiness of different parties. Uh, so the capacity of mediation usually, if I write your uh, statement correctly, uh, is highly dependent upon, you know, the mutual uh, understanding of availability and so on, which uh, I think has not happened. On Qatar, uh, KSC, we have uh, a very good relationship with Qatar. We have, of course, a good relationship with Qatar, but what happened in Two years ago, we put a uh, blockade of Qatar, and I, if it was not Iran, uh, which opened the space and border and uh, uh, force to Qatar, Qatar would have been strangulated. Uh, and uh, actually, I was in the last week for a, a conference on security perception of different uh, players in the fashion world, and I was astonished by the way that Qataris are thinking about the Saudis. Uh, they think the damage that has been done to them is significant, and they don't see a future, uh, near future for uh, reconciliation. Uh, with Saudi Arabia, we have said many times that we are not for more confrontation, we are for freezing the the conflicts, uh, we have been open to different mediation suggestions, but I think uh, they are not uh, as uh, we are. Today I, uh, I read the news, uh, maybe there is a slight change on, on that report. On UK and Iran, I think uh, what is important about UK, uh, of course we have the history with the UK, before revolution, I mean, for centuries and after the revolution. But what we see is, uh, I think this is the unofficial reading, that there are some tendencies in UK to use the US for domestic politics in, in UK. And there's a competition that we throws up in this prime uh, ministerial you know, campaign. And everybody is sending signals uh, I know you don't want to debate on the students and on the what are you for the future. So, a component of domestic politics in the world, but uh, in some respect we see commonality between the US and UK, but uh, still uh, there are differences. Uh, and uh, I think what the UK did with the uh, time here uh, recently in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, was not by any means acceptable, not to us, just the international uh, actors here and there. So you see um, elements of domestic politics and international politics. If there are no questions, there's one from my researcher, can you take oh, this one? That was the most important one yes, from the beginning. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, my main job was on was just teaching. And, so I invite you to the accidental questions more than other. Please. Um, thank you for coming here. Because um, I want to ask a question about Israel. Because of the political turmoil in Israel, do you think that Israel will take any action against Iran to distract its people from the political turmoil? And how prepared is Iran in case of something like that? Very good question. <laughs> so you know there is a story in Bible that uh, there was a ceremony and uh, they kept the, the good wine till the last minute. <laughs> uh, of course it's wrong a story because it is a Christian thing wine. But uh, it's symbolically of a good question. I think uh, Israel has a lot of challenges though. And they use the issue of Iran, especially not only of for covering up, you know, all its uh, uh, let's say uh, deficiencies because uh, the contradiction inside Zionist entity in 
from the research were so, so many and multiple layers, but I think they do the, to, to sort any adventure against Iran, because Iran has proven that it's, it would be very uh, strong in defending its interests. Excellency, uh, this is Jaipur. Thank you so much for coming. There are many, many questions in our minds, and we put together this uh, this meeting at very short notice. And you were here are here for a very short time, and I know you want you want to leave, but I won't let you leave until I tell you <coughs> that you were a real scholar who told us why the general wants to die and the diplomat wants to lie. Do, don't please forget that you have talked to me about arranging the institutional collaboration between your institution and uh, the Pakistan Institute of International Affairs. And next time you come, please do come for a longer time so that we can have a larger session. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's nice. and I really enjoyed it. And, and this my is heart is more here than I'm going to do. This is our journal. We've been publishing it for 72 years. <laughs> Sorry, for a second.